old school bodybuilding clothing company. If it's been three and a half hours since you last ate protein, and now you're starting to freak out, you are old school. If watching someone sit on a hammer machine for five minutes between sets playing with their phone pisses you off, you are definitely old school. OSBBC.com for the hardest training athletes. I'm Dave Palumbo, founder of Species Nutrition. From my earliest bodybuilding days, I believed in only putting the best in my body. And that lives on in the Species Nutrition line of products. I put my name and reputation on every bottle of Species Nutrition products. If you want to be your absolute best, join the evolution. After working hard at the gym, you need a mattress that works as hard as you do. Spinaline has engineered the perfect mattress for you and your active lifestyle. Don't compromise your recovery with inferior sleep. Order your Spinaline mattress today. Hey guys, we're super excited to be here at the LA Fit Expo. It's our third year in a row. And uh, what we're going to be doing today is we're going to be launching a tasty pastry. It's a low carb Pop Tart. It's got three to four grams of net carbs. And we love this show. This is our best place to be in LA. Hey, this is the game Triple H from the WWE. You're watching RxMuscle.com, the truth in bodybuilding. Rx Television on RxMuscle.com. This is Ask Dave, better known as Hashtag Ask Dave. Your 30-minute question and answer show with Dave Palumbo. All your questions, diet, training, supplementation, IFBB pros, news, whatever's on your mind, bodybuilding or otherwise, it is all on the tables. We now bring in Dave Palumbo. Dave, um, yesterday on After Hours, uh, it, it's funny, we get a lot of the comments whenever we have Greg Valentino, which is almost every week, about how Greg knows everyone. Mention the name and Greg knows him. And it, that happens to be the case. Greg seems to know everyone from bodybuilding lore and seems to have a funny story about everyone <laughs> from bodybuilding lore. And yesterday it was Victor Richards' turn. It kind of turned a little serious as Greg Valentino had a lot to say about Victor Richards, saying that just about everything he said on that show, he would have said right to his face. Hilarious, hilarious stories. As always, you want to get the primer for whoever has not seen yesterday's episode of After Hours. You know, I, I'll tell you why I love Greg. I like him because I we, we get along and we see the world very similar. But he reminds me of my dad, okay? Because my dad was the greatest storyteller of all time. Except as, you know, when he got older, he was telling the same stories over and over. But it didn't matter how many times he told the story. It was just as effective. I've heard the Victor Richards story four million times, okay? And, and I believe, you know, Greg's not a liar. So I know that the stories are accurate. And so when Victor came on and I asked him about Greg and when Greg used to spot him, because Greg said, you know, Victor would oil up his arms and he, Greg had to use these disgusting sponges that he would the work out with. The sponge story, yeah. Yeah. And so when he told the story and I mentioned to Victor, Victor pretended he didn't even know what I was talking about. And matter of fact, he said, he didn't, no one spotted me. I used to work out with the Barbarian Brothers. They spotted me. So I knew that, you know, so I knew that was going to irk Greg because I know that Greg was like his little, you know, slave boy back in the day. He used to do pull the dumbbells out for him and he used to he really worked you know because he kind of admired him and looked up to him as a fan almost so <laughs> when I tell Greg that Victor didn't know who he was or 
kind of knew where he was, but said he didn't tra- spot him. He went crazy. And uh, it was, it was, if anyone hasn't seen it, it's, it's a very funny uh, segment. And, uh, you know, I don't know if Victor's going to be insulted by it, but probably not. He'll probably laugh at it because <laughs> he has to know who Greg is. You know, he has to remember that, that incident. There's no way. If Greg was doing that every day for him, pretty much, you know he knows who Greg is. So, anyway, it was... It was very funny. A lot of people reached out to me and said it was a funny story. They liked it. Well, if he doesn't remember after watching that, he'll remember exactly who Greg is. Again, if you haven't watched it, After Hours right now on the RX Muscle YouTube channel. Before we get to the questions, Dave, the latest from our good friends over at Titan Medical. Yeah, I know. A lot of people I know are asking me about, hey, you know, Dave, um, it's uh, the summer is coming and, you know, obviously shows are coming. They want to get blood work. They want to, you know, some people want to get on HRT. And they don't, you know, know what the, the process is. It, I'm, it's so easy over at titanmedicalcenter.com. You go over there, call them up, tell them Dave Palumbo RX Muscle sent you. You get your discount. You do telemedicine visit with the doctor online. There's no going there. You don't have to go in. You have a prescription for everything. Once you get your, they send you for your blood work, which is if you have to pay out of your pocket, it, it's it's super, very discounted rate for for the panel that they're doing. If you did it at least once a year or every six months, you know, once again we talk about how important it is to get blood work. They do a very comprehensive panel over there, and then they go over the panel with you and go over the results with you, and then you can get whatever you want pretty much in terms of do you need to go on HRT, you want to go on HCG. If you're doing my pregnancy protocol and trying to get you know, your girlfriend or wife pregnant, you can, you can do that through them. If you want to just be healthier, you can buy their injectable glutathione. I'm actually using right now, Sid, injectable vitamin C with injectable glutathione. I, I, I actually used to do the glutathione every day. I've been doing it every other day, and I've been doing a lot of vitamin C injectable just because you know for, it's supposed to be very anti-cancer and stuff like that. And I'll tell you one thing, the vitamin C takes a long time to draw up through an insulin needle because it's a little thicker. And everyone claims it hurts a lot. It does, it hurts a little bit, but I, I don't even find it a problem. Uh, sometimes I'll mix it with their amino acid blend, uh, the injectable amino acid blend. So they have a lot of really good you know, formulas over there. If I was competing nowadays, I would have been. Go- I would have had 40 bottles in my refrigerator I'd be injecting every day. Now, nowadays, I don't really care that much. I'm just trying to stay healthy. But... Uh, they, they really have a lot of good performance you know, uh, formulas in terms of pre-workout type stuff where you're going to get vasodilation. Even if you can't get an erection or you, you, know, you want to have a little bit easier time in the sack, they got some, some really interesting uh, compounds over there. Viagra, Cialis type uh, stuff. They also, Trochas go into your tongue. They have that PT-141, which is also increases sex drive. So you really have a, a nice variety. And the good thing is they'll go over all that with you on the phone. And the people who work there, they're, they're, they're so good with customer service. Um, I can't really, uh, I can't thank them enough because, you know, they do a lot for me and my family as well. And I've sent a lot of people and friends there and everyone's very happy. So I want to just thank them for that. So check out Titan Medical, a good friends of RX Muscle. Let's go to the questions. The first two questions, as always, from the Dave Palumbo experience at the first question. Uh, is insulin ever used in a cutting or recomp cycle to carb load when muscles get flat? You know, um, I don't find usually when you're dieting that you need insulin um, very much um, unless you have blood sugar problems. So what, I, what I've what i been doing, with I do with all my athletes now, and this is something new that I've just really started doing the last couple of years, and that's why I always say my coaching, my knowledge base evolves as time evolves and as my education evolves. And as the information out there evolves. So I always have everyone test their blood sugars, especially most people have normal blood sugars. It's the fasting blood sugars in the morning that can be a little high. So sometimes uh, when I'm dieting people, I'm not, I would never have them on a fast acting insulin because it's just usually unnecessary unless they're diabetic. But a lot of people are running high fasting blood sugars even while dieting on very low carbs. And that could just be that their beta cell function is, is, is struggling. It could be through genetics. It could be because they're taking a lot of GH because growth hormone, we know, doesn't allow insulin to work as well. So sometimes I'll have them on a fasting, but I, I mean, on a, on a slow acting, you know, long, uh, what we call like a basal insulin, I very, very, very infrequently have someone on actually a fast acting while dieting. I used to experiment with that a little bit, and I think that I was just very insulin resistant when I would take GH, so sometimes it would work okay for me. And I was so lean, it didn't matter, but for most people, the fast-acting insulins can, can hurt fat loss. 
So unless I have like a freak of a bodybuilder who's on a ton of carbs while they're dieting, and there's a couple out there, you know, that, that would fit that category, I wouldn't use insulin. Plus, insulin definitely has a, an abdominal bloating, you know, type of situation when you use exogenous insulin. Insulin in and of itself doesn't cause that. It, it's the exogenous use of insulin that will cause some abdominal bloating. Okay, so we don't want that pre-contest. So a lot of times, insulin doesn't come into the into the equation. Now, some people will use it to carb up at the end. I don't really carb people on an exorbitant amount of carbs. And if their body is producing enough of their own insulin, there's really no need to, to use exogenous insulin. And how do you know if your body's producing enough insulin to absorb your carbs? Because when you're carving up, if you test your blood sugars two hours after your meals, if they're under 130 or even under 125, then you're, you're producing enough insulin, you're absorbing all the carbs you're eating. So it, it, I, I haven't seen in my recent years anyone who, maybe one or two people that ever needed insulin pre-contest, it's just, it's just not necessary. And I think, if anything, you're just gonna get yourself into trouble because if your blood sugar drops while you're dieting, you don't wanna have to eat carbs you know, to make up for it. And I think what happens is people use that as an excuse, my blood sugar is low, I gotta eat. And then, and then they don't lose body fat because of that. So I would stay away from it. Second question again from the Dave Lumbo Experience app. I'm dealing with a TRT facility and they're directing me to do very small doses versus uh, the larger doses once or twice a week intramuscular, will this keep levels more stable? It's not a bad thing to microdose every day. Like, a, like in other words, let's say you're doing 200 milligrams of testosterone for the week. Instead of doing 200 in one shot, they have you do, they break it up over seven shots. To me, it's a pain in the ass. Okay, it, it, no one can remember to take a shot every, I didn't take a shot every day when I was doing regular cycles. You know, I would do it every other day. So. It could be a real annoyance, you know, to do that. Um, and I don't personally, I never felt like, when I took my one shot a week, I felt good the whole week. So I never felt like ups and downs. Now, if you're gonna do, if you're gonna break it up, maybe like two shots a week, you know, maybe like a Monday, you know, Thursday shot or something like that, might be okay. That, I think that's okay. I and mean, that's probably will accomplish what you're looking for so you don't get peaks and valleys at all. But you really shouldn't anyway, because think about it, when you take a shot of testosterone and anthate, it takes a while for your levels to rise and then they kind of stay up here. And then before they start dipping again, you're taking your next shot the following week. So once you get past that first initial three weeks on HRT, you really don't get ups and downs anymore. You have steady levels because the anthate is so long acting. So I mean, if you wanted to do two shots a week, that would be good. I think microdosing is, 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 is probably a waste of time. Now, if you're using test propionate, which I don't know why anyone would use that for HRT. If you, you, microdosing it every day would work because it's a very short acting compound. But I don't know anyone in their right mind who would use such a short acting compound for HRT. If you do HRT, you do a long acting compound like an anthate So I think, I think what happens is people are always trying to find a better way to make a wheel. <laughs> you know, unfortunately, once you make it round, there's really not that much more you can do for it. So you know, when we're talking about cycles, full-blown cycles, we can, there's room for maneuvering. When we talk about HRT, I mean, you're only taking 200 milligrams a week. You could do it if you want to do it, but for most people, it's going to be more of an annoyance. Let's go to our Instagram question. Again, if you're not already following us on Instagram, our handle is official underscore RX muscle. If you're watching us for the first time on YouTube, hit the subscribe button below, hit the notification bell. You're not going to miss any of our show's segments anything that we upload over the course of the week um, as we now start to rev up the engine for the contest season. Um, we're going to start to get a lot more of these, uh, of the IPV pros that are going to be competing uh, in the, over the course of the next three, four weeks. Obviously, many have been asking us about Nick Walker, about Blessing Abadibu. Uh, we do plan on getting them on, uh, which kind of a format that's to be determined, but we will be getting them on over the course of the next few weeks. And then, of course, revving it up again with Iron Bait. Uh, as the contest season gets into full swing. So again, if you haven't already done so, subscribe, hit the notification bell. <clears throat> Sorry, if you like what you're watching, hit the like button, comment below. Obviously that helps. And as always, we thank you for your ongoing support. Let's go to Caesar Pat. Would using finasteride to stop side effects, for, um, side effects from androgenic compounds hurt the androgenic look that they give to the body? One more time, read that again, Sid. Would using finasteride to stop side effects from androgenic compounds hurt the androgenic look that they give to the body? No, 
No, because first of all, when you take, if you're gonna use a little bit of finasteride, or I recommend people start with something a little milder, like, almost like uh, my Testalyze product, which, which will blunt DHC production a little bit. You never wanna like, you never wanna annihilate DHC, just like you don't wanna annihilate estrogen, because you need some DHT for sex drive and you know, for, for feeling, you know, uh, getting a little bit of a pump. But testosterone is the, is, the, is the molecule that does most of the good stuff we're looking for. But you need balance. It's all about balance. And that's, you know, when I made Testalyze, that's what it was. It was, it was a testosterone optimizer. Balance, estrogen, DHT, testosterone levels. Um, obviously, when you start taking exogenous drugs, it makes, sometimes you, you need something a little stronger. But unless you ever, like, like I genetically have a predisposition to produce a lot of DHT. When I had my DNA tested with the DNA t power test that I sell at my uh, Dave Palumbo website, um, my DHT, I, like, I'm a high DHT converter. And I knew that. I knew that because I always had a lot of acne as a kid, and when I hit 30, I still lose my hair, and, I, I, and when I would get DHT levels read, even on no cycle, my DHT was high all the time. So for me, I, I, you know, a product like Testalyze lowers it, but not enough. So look, get this. I'm on no HRT. I take no testosterone. I'll take an HCG shot you know, maybe once every two weeks, and I'll, do, and I'll get my blood worked, and I'm on finasteride. I take 2.5 milligrams per day, which is a nice dose. You know, that's a higher dose than most people take. And when I get my blood work tested, my DHT is in normal range. It's not low, it's not even low normal. It's like in the middle, middle range, which means that naturally I am a very high converter of DHT. So for someone like myself, a finasteride drug is probably warranted if I want to avoid you know, long-term prostate enlargement, you know, hair loss, and, and acne breakouts. However, you know, for most people, if you're not a high DHT converter and you start taking something like finasteride because you get you know, neurotic about you know, you're losing your hair or something like that, you can go too low. You'll go and get your DHT tested, it'll be zero you know, or one or two. I mean, it'll be so low, you, they won't, they'll think there's lab error because you just don't, ha you don't have that much enzyme to convert your testosterone. So you have to really, it's a, really an individual thing. Go get your blood work tested. Check your DHT, which is one of the things that when I give out my, my list of blood work for people to go get checked, DHT is always on there because I, I'm interested. I want to see what, how people convert. And remember, if you take a Reminex or an aromatase inhibitor that inhibits estrogen production, you'll produce more DHT because remember, there's two pathways. Testosterone can go to DHT conversion or can go to estrogen conversion. If you block the estrogen route, taking like a Reminex or Femara or Romacin, you'll get more going to DHT. So when I would take an aromatase inhibitor back in the day, no one knew this, I would always notice I broke out more. I couldn't figure it out. It was because I was producing more DHT. So you, you got to check your levels on your cycle, off your cycle, and see what your, your natural DHT conversion is. If it's not that high and it's just a little high, or it's maybe on the, on the high normal side, you want to get it a little lower, then you just you take a product like Testalyze. If you're very high and you're like off the charts, like I've seen some people like me, um, then you go with something a little stronger like finasteride. You can start with a milligram a day and see how that works. I found for me the sweet spot was 2.5 milligrams. Um, most people who have prostate issues, when they put you on it, they put you on five milligrams a day. I found that five was too much. So you got to experiment. There's no, there's no one size fits all on, on this thing, but it, it all comes down to being smart, getting your blood work done. Uh, this one's from Tyler Roger Joseph. He asks it one way. I'm going to ask you in a different way. He asks, is it necessary to track your weights or keep a logbook during your competition career or when you were just getting started out in bodybuilding? Did you keep a track of your splits, what you did in the gym, and I guess what you planned on doing? Going? How did you track your workouts mm. during and I guess going into a gym session? Yeah. I, uh, when I was a runner prior to being a bodybuilder, you know, we used to, the, the whole thing with runners is logging how many miles you, run, you do a week. So, you know, you come back, all right, I did eight miles, part in your little book, and at the end of the week, you add up all your miles you did for the week, and you know, I, I wanna hit, um, let's see, I wanna hit 60 miles this week. So you had to run an average of what, like, you know, like, like almost nine miles a day, you know? And there would be, and you'd have goals, depending on what, you know, what part of the season is. And that was very useful because it was hard to calculate in your head, you know, because some days you would do more and some days you'd do less. 
when I got to bodybuilding, I found that that whole logging thing of, of workouts was 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 kind of annoying, and it was kind of it kind of gave me nightmares of my running days. <laughs> I really didn't want. So what I did was I just I would just knew my routine, and I was I was like a fanatic. I didn't miss workouts or anything like that. And so, but for some people, it, it helps to write down you know their their workouts and stuff like that. I found that after doing it you know repetitively for six months, it was like almost like. It was into my head. It was like etched into my head. I knew exactly what I was doing. Now, at certain times of the year when I would change up stuff, maybe I would write down. I always wrote my cycles down, however. I always knew what I was doing cycle-wise because I wanted to see how long I was on, what I was going to take at each week. That, that I was very, very organized with. Not so much the work. The workouts were organized. I just didn't write them all down because I found it. I found it to be a chore to have to come home or do it before you go to the gym. Write down everything you're going to do and everything. I don't... I can't do that. It's too much. You talk to a guy like Guy Cisternino, he writes down when he goes to the bathroom. You know, he, he has the greatest log books of all time. I mean, if you want to look through log books, th- there's not an, a, an iota of data that in there that he has not journaled down on, on that paper. I guarantee you probably you can go back 10 years uh, to this day and find out what he ate for lunch and how many grams of protein, fat, and carbs he had and what supplements he took and what, what, you know, what PEDs he took. Guaranteed. You could even see how many times he, he pooped and, and, and peed on that day. That's just him. He enjoys that. He, that, and that methodical you know, approach enables him to stay focused and make sure that he gets the job done. So everyone's different. You know, if you're like one of those journalists, you like to write everything down, write it down. My father kept a diary for 60 years or something like that. He had, he wrote, he had 60 years of diaries when he passed. I have boxes of these things, you know, dating back from before I was born. I went back and I actually looked at his journal entry when I was born, you know, that, that, which is crazy, right? I mean, you know, so it's cool to be able to see that, but I don't know if I have the patience. To, to, I have so many other neurotic little tendencies. I don't need to add another one, but some people like it. It does work for some people. Let's go to Zach Stroop. Um, inflammation is a topic that I know you've addressed on many different uh, occasions, many different episodes. He wants to know if there are any certain steroids that can help lower inflammation in the body. You know, we all say that DECA is a great anti-inflammatory, and it is, okay? So does it eliminate total body inflammation, or is it just like more of a joint reliever? I tend to think it, you know, I've had this discussion with several doctors, and it, it seems as though DECA might bind because it looks... Structure, in other words, when, when a drug binds to a receptor, it's because it's almost like putting a key into a lock. Uh, the DECA molecule seems to fit the, the keyhole for cortisone or cortisol receptors. We know that cortisol is a catabolic hormone our body releases to deal with inflammation. Uh, it raises blood sugar. For some reason, the DECA molecule fits into that keyhole. So it, it tricks the body into thinking that it's, it's cortisone, but it's not. It's, 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 it's actually you know, an anabolic hormone, but it, it initiates that, that anti-inflammation effect on the joints and connective tissue. I don't think it has a total body anti-inflammation effect, however. In other words, it doesn't inhibit the inflammatory cytokines you know, or prostaglandins out there that will initiate, you know, total body inflammation. So it's more of a localized joint type of, uh, of um, effect. Having said that, are there other anabol- anabolic steroids that reduce total body inflammation? I, I would say no. Um, but the catabolic hormones, you know, from dexamethasone, cortisol, you know, Kenalog, there's a whole bunch of them that, that, that are utilized in medicine. Those have, you know, in, anti-inflammatory effects on the entire body. And, but the problem is they're catabolic and they break down muscles. So... To answer the question, no, but there's plenty of nutritional supplements that actually can lower total body inflammation. We know that fish oils do that. We know that um, in my Omega Lyse product, uh, my essential fatty acid supplement product, I have a, a, an omega-7 fat in there known as palmitoleic acid. And palmitoleic acid is, an, is a known total body inf- inflammatory decreaser. The best way to actually test whether your, your inflammatory markers are too high is you can test your C-reactive protein on blood work. That's one of the markers that I recommend people get tested. And you can see if you have total body inflammation that's super high, and I don't usually see it with bodybuilders, believe it or not, too much. Um, that's something you might want to start taking these essential fatty acids, these palmitoleic acids, to try to get those down. Even curcumin, 
uh, is a good you know total body in, uh, anti-inflammatory type of a, a new, um, herbal supplement you can initiate in there as well. But I only find when I see total body inflammation, like C-reactive that's high in people, it usually is people who have like colitis or Crohn's disease or all sort of colitis or all the different like chronic inflammatory diseases, arthritis, those will really, you know, skyrocket that C-reactive protein. And, but other than that, I don't, even in bodybuilders who are eating a tremendous amount of food and the pro-inflammatory foods and they're, you know, obviously working out creates a lot of inflammation. I just don't see high inflammation in most people. It seems like it's a genetic thing. Um, interesting one here. I know we've often had that debate between 80s and 90s versus today in terms of training in particular. Here's another angle to it. It's from Jace, uh, Joseph Latcher. Uh, did the bodybuilders in the 70s, 80s, and 90s train harder because overtraining wasn't as understood to the degree that it is today? Yeah, I mean, no one knew. They thought the more you trained, the bigger you got. And they had nothing to do all day because no one worked. You know? So they thought the, whoever can spend the most time in the gym would get the best results. And look, that's, that's the runner's mentality, too. When I was runner, the more you run, the faster you are, right? The better you're going to be. And no one thinks about, we just didn't think about recovery back then. And we didn't think about, well, at least I didn't. I didn't have a coach who was telling me, you know what? Recovery is important. you got to take days off. No one drilled that into my head. I had to read that in the, in the magazines and start saying, you know what? I'm not making progress. I'm, I'm at a plateau. If something's not right, you know, I see a lot of the guys I was training with were chronic overtrainers. So they would run around the gym like doing a million sets. And I, you know what? After doing six or eight or ten sets, the most, I was like shot. I was like, you know what? I can get through it because I had that runner's mentality of, you know, more is better. But I didn't feel better. And I didn't recover as fast. And so when I started reducing my volume in my workouts and, in trying to, and, and I found that I was stronger in the gym, I can generate more intensity because I was mentally fresher and I was getting better results. So you have to find your own sweet spot. I think back in the day, they just didn't know any better and they, they succeeded in despite themselves. Imagine if Arnold didn't overtrain. Maybe he would have been even bigger and better. That's why when we say we have better training techniques today, we have better supplements today, we have better, we have better information and machinery and, and uh, gym equipment today. That's why guys, that's, it's not just drugs. They use drugs back then, but that's why guys are better today and bigger because we know more. We, the science of bodybuilding has gone through the roof compared to what it was back in the 70s. Um, <clears throat> did uh, Vinny the Chin and Jimmy the Bull ever get into a fight? I don't think they got into a fight. They, uh, Jimmy got into an argument with him once because I think he said something disrespectful to someone and Jimmy went off on him, you know. <laughs> there's a video of like there's a question about like is there a video of Vinny and Jimmy the Chin? I, there Vinny. probably is somewhere out there. I gotta look for it. You know, we we think about it. You know, we've done 12 years of content on Arx Muscle. <laughs> when people people ask me about these videos, I don't, I can't even find them because you've got to remember, not everything. We didn't start on YouTube. We were we were streaming everything from Rx Muscle itself. So if I if someone finds the video on Rx Muscle, even if it's not playing properly, I can go back once I have the the date. And the file and the name of the video, I can go back and look for it on our server and pull it off. That's a lot of times when we put up old stuff, I'll pull it off our server and then upload it to YouTube. Some of that old stuff is very funny. A lot of times I don't put the stuff up just because there's a, that we I have original music. I mean, I'm using like um, trademark music and stuff like that, and, and YouTube dings that a lot of times when we pull the video. So I, some of the stuff might have to be re-edited, but there's there's some there's, there is some funny stuff that we did back in the day with the Heavy Muscle TV show. So, uh, you know, indulge me, if you will. I, we're getting a lot of different questions about what Dave thinks on uh, Phil Viz versus Greg Doucette, what Dave thinks about Greg Doucette's cookbook, what Dave thinks about this beef, that beef. We're not doing the beef thing anymore. We're not doing the drama thing anymore. I know a lot of you have been asking us what Dave has to say about this guy's video, about that guy's video. We're done with that. We're done with that because, you know, when I started with the RX Muscles, I was back in the end of 2013, right? And I figured out exactly what we were doing. I had a very long series of talks with Dave, and I'm like, look, we need to really refocus the Dave Palumbo brand on what will we do here on Ask Dave, right? Where Dave is giving you information, cutting edge knowledge about bodybuilding science, about, you know, bringing on some of the brightest minds in bodybuilding, like we do in Guru Talk, about bringing on, you know, some of the biggest luminaries 
personalities on Iron Debate, uh, Muscle in the Morning, which gives you updates throughout the course of you know the week as far as what IFBB pros, you know, upcoming NPC competitors, what they're up to. You know, yes, we do bring on guests that maybe you have never heard of them. Maybe you will not watch the episode, and maybe that episode will get 1,000, 1,500 to 2,000. But you know what? If it's a compelling bodybuilding story, that's our mission statement. That's what we're here to do. We're not indulging in any of the drama anymore. We're not doing any more of the what do we think about this beef. Dave responds to this beef. We're done with that. So if that's something that you came here for, then you're going to have to find other avenues to, you know, find that level of entertainment because we're not doing that anymore. Now, somebody did ask a question from Dan Elos about uh, Dave's thoughts on something that Lane Norton did. Dave and Lane Norton have a healthy respect for one another. They can disagree here and there and still address one another in a respectful manner. If you have questions about what Dave thinks about Lane Norton or any other bright mind, the bodybuilding world, as far as their theories, practices, Bring it on because we will respond to those. They will do so in a respectful fashion and they will do the same. And that's how we're going to proceed from here on out. So the question is thoughts on when prepping for a show, Lane Norton gives his athletes beta alanine, 2000 MG three times a day to keep them full and aids performance and lean mass gains. Uh, I know you'll say luxury item, but benefits if you can afford it. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. There's a, there's a lot of supplements out there that people should be taking. You know, I, I had a I have a client of mine who you know I have on um, who's the week of her show right now, and uh, and she's gaining weight. And this is these are the depletion days. You know, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. And I'm like, how are you gaining weight? Are you go, are you going to the bathroom? You know, I, I you know it's it's, it's not a f- fun subject to ask. And I said to her, and, and you know, legitimately, and she's like, well, not really. I think I have to start taking Fiberlize. Now she has Fiberlize in her house. Okay, and it doesn't have to be my fiber supplement, but I'm just saying she has fiberized, obviously, because I told her to get it, and she's not using it. And I'm like, why wouldn't you use it? Oh, I don't know. You know, <laughs> so I, you know, there's so many things out there that, that you can use, and some people get good benefits out of it. You know, I know Lane trains a lot of natural athletes too. So for the natural athletes, they're not taking testosterone, and they're not taking clenbuterol, and they're not taking, you know, uh, growth hormone. So for them, you know, sometimes you can, you know, they have the extra money and they and they want to use some supplements that are going to help them performance wise. I'm not against. Pre- I like pre workouts. You know, uh, especially in, in in a pre contest situation, as long as you're not taking the pre workouts that have a million milligrams of amino acids in it, and because then what happens is your body can use those for fuel. Um, I think beta alanine's fine. You know, there's nothing wrong with it, with that. I mean, using it if it works for you, uh, you know. So. I'm not. I, I'm a big supplement guy. Look, I, I. If you saw the list of supplements that I'm always taking, because I'm always experimenting with stuff. I'm. I'll run through anything new that comes out. I'll take it just to see how my body responds to it. And then this, the good stuff, I'll, I'll recommend to people. And then the really good stuff, I'll make myself as a species supplement. And if someone has a good product out there, and I don't want to make it, I'll. I sell a lot of other people's products on my DavePalumbo.com website. So, um. Personally, you know, I think uh, you know a little so beta alanine prior to a workout is good because it really extends endurance and stuff like that. Um, so I'm in favor of it, and I don't think it's necessarily going to sabotage anyone's diet. So that's good. It's the people that take like you know branch chain aminos, essential aminos, all day long while they're dieting, and then they don't understand why they're not losing weight. So that that's what I'm against. You know, for in a pre contest state, in an off season scenario, whatever works, use it. You know. You can do whatever supplements you want. I don't care if they have carbs in them or not. Have carbs in them as long as you're not missing meals. Sometimes people drink too many shakes because they're constantly guzzling carbs down and they're just not hungry and then they can't eat the good food. You know, taking in a lot of sugars and stuff like that is not a good replacement for complex carbohydrates. They're going to be much more sustained, you know, in terms of energy throughout the day. So I have no problem with that. You know, that I don't, I'm. Matter of fact, you know, I might recommend it myself, you know, given the fact that if people are getting good results with it, then why not? Last question here from Dave DeCock. You know, we often talk about, um, you know, bodybuilders like yourself, you know, who were always, you know, uh, notable in the realm of bodybuilding, but never went pro. So the question is about Matt Mendenhall, and he's often been mentioned in this light. Is he the best bodybuilder to never go pro? I don't know about that. I mean, he, he's certainly probably one of the top five never to go pro. I mean, uh, Edgar Fletcher, another great one, even though he, he Edgar was not a great person. You know, uh, I didn't really 
hit it off with him as a but the guy had a crazy physique. Uh, no doubt about it. Mendenhall, crazy physique. Just never put it together. You know, maybe sometimes when things come too easy and people are too genetically blessed, they go the opposite direction of what Ronnie Coleman did. Ronnie Coleman, genetic blessed, crazy work ethic. I want to be the best of all time. And he probably is because of that. And then you got guys that have the genetics to be the best of all time, but it comes so easy to them that they just coast. And maybe they don't push. Look, I mean, Rami's a good example of that. Rami had... We knew he was going to be Mr. Olympia in 2013. We just didn't know when it was going to happen. And it took till 2020 for him to finally, you know, be able to go that extra mile, okay, to realize his genetic potential. And I still think he's got more room to go and get even better. Because, once again, why make yourself suffer that much if you don't need to? And I understand that mentality. When it comes so easy, sometimes you just coast. When I was in school as a kid... School came really easy to me, and I would I would do the absolute minimum. And I know it drew, drove my parents crazy because they're like, if this kid only really applied himself, you know, he would be he would be the best, you know, in terms of school. I was just I was satisfied with being, you know, in the top group, you know, because I was lazy. And ironically, later in life, when I realized when people started passing by me in certain areas, I didn't like that because I wanted to, I did I was very competitive. I still am. I wanted to be the best. I realized I had to work harder, and that's when I got into running and then bodybuilding. I gave. I went the opposite direction. I went from coasting to putting absolute, maybe too much, too much effort into what I was doing. But it also enabled me and taught me work ethic, and, and it made me a success in everything I did later in life too. Especially even now with you know with, with what I do here, nutrition, anything I put my mind into, I go a hundred percent now because I never want to go back to that point where I, I give up something and lose out because I didn't put enough effort into it because I was being lazy. So Mendenhall definitely up there, absolutely. Edgar Fletcher, another person that comes to mind, absolutely up there uh, as a person who should have turned pro and, and didn't. That is going to do for this episode of As Dave. This upcoming, the next over the, over the course of the next two days, actually, all new episode of Iron Rage, and then an episode that Dave filmed last week. We're going to be launching it uh, in a couple of different segments coming up over the course of the next 48 hours. Uh, Ron Love. This is the one that a lot of you have been asking about for a very long time. So we finally got him on, just like we got Victor Richards on last week, another long-awaited interview, but Ron Love. We're going to be releasing it in a couple of different content pieces over the course of the next 48 hours. So Ron Love with Dave Palumbo. Keep an eye out for that. I, I um, want to tease one more thing, Sid, too. Um, <laughs> I did Iron Rage yesterday, and I had interviewed right before Iron Rage Guy Grundy. And yes, if you guys, yes, yes. If you guys don't know Guy Grundy, he's you know an Australian bodybuilder that came over to the U.S. He's doing acting gigs now, and he's producing his own movies. And I, I knew him and Lee knew each other. Not like close friends, but knew each other. Obviously, he's from the same country. So Guy stayed on the show, and man, did I have a great time with those two guys on Iron Rage. You guys are going to love this Iron Rage. And Guy tells a, a, a story <laughs> about Lee that he didn't even want to tell. Lee made him tell the story, and Lee didn't even know what it was. He's like, no, nah, I can't tell the story. Lee's like, tell it. I don't care. There's nothing you can say that I don't care. So you guys are going to want to hear that story, I promise you. Yeah, this is nuts. So I, you know, <laughs> the, uh, during the course of the episode, I read questions off our, off our Instagram feed. Uh, somebody just tagged us in this one, uh, just DM'd us uh, this one image. I don't know how well you could see it right now. Uh, it's kind of grainy right now. Yeah. Tyler, if you could look this up uh, on the computer, the handle is Tim underscore Taylor underscore underscore. So it's Tim Taylor. Uh, he's 55 years old, Dave, and he's training with uh, Robbie Robinson, of course, at 75 years old. <laughs> and it's a photo shoot of them two standing side by side. And I mean, my God, like, he, first of all, the guy, he's 55, you would, you would think he's like 35. Yeah. Robbie Robinson, as we all know, has the look and body of a 55-year-old. It is incredible. I mean, the caption goes, uh, Robbie Army, 16-week training wrap-up photo. Should you, do you have it, uh, Tyler? How do you spell Taylor? T-A-Y-L-O-R. T-A-Y-L-O-R, yeah, Tim Taylor. You know, I, I asked Ron Love, because Ron Love's 69, he's going to be 70 next year, and he wants to compete again. He's 280. I said, I'd love to see you, Ron, and, and, and Robbie Robinson go head-to-head -head in competition. He's like, I would destroy him. <laughs> I loved it. I love confidence. I said, Ron, you know what? Now I want to see it. I, I said, I think the whole bodybuilding world wants to see it. Ron loved Robbie Robinson one-on-one. -on -one. So, I don't know. Maybe <laughs> 
I don't know if Tyler. All right. Well, you know what, Tyler, we'll, we'll, we'll bring that up again. Uh, so we'll, we'll, I'll send that to Dave, and we'll have Dave do a little reaction All to right. that. I know he's sure. having to pull on right now, but that's going to do for this episode of Ask Dave again right now uh, on the YouTube channel. All new episode of Heavy Muscle Radio, uh, the After Hours podcast, and over the course of the next forty eight hours, all new Iron Rage, and then the side one with Guy Grundy, entertaining Australian actor, is going to tell some of the funny stories of Lee Priest, and then. Of course, over the next 48 hours, clips, and then the full episode with Ron Love. For Tyler Shore and Dave Palumbo, I'm Sadiq Faruqi. We'll see you next time.